So let's get on with the panel. Uh, we are very pleased and grateful uh, to begin the summit with Ambassador Michael Froman, U.S. Trade Representative. And I, I think it is uh, fair to say that his appointment was greeted with universal enthusiasm. And uh, as everybody recognized, uh, he has been for the, the last four plus years as the president's point person on international economic issues. Um, and also prior to that, of course, had uh, many achievements in the private sector and also previously in government, both in the White House and in the Treasury. And also, I think people really appreciate uh, the personal attributes of overcoming the adversity of a very meager education. Princeton, um, Oxford, Harvard Law. So he overcame all of that to achieve <laughs> the uh, position that he has today. Um, in the short time that he has been in office, basically, I guess, five months at this point, um, he really has re-energized the U.S. trade agenda and has also re-established the U.S. global leadership on trade issues. And he's done that really by reaching out directly and personally uh, to his counterparts. So in that short time that he's been in office, he's already been to Africa, he's been to Asia, he's been to Europe, been to Mexico. And so um, I think we're really seeing a degree of um, a greater intensity in terms of uh, U.S. trade agenda, and uh, thank you very much for that. Um, we in the services community are particularly appreciative of the priority that you are attaching to services and helping people to recognize that the role that services plays, uh, not just in terms of the uh, employment and the uh, production from the services industry, but also the role that services play in the competitiveness of all the other elements uh, of the U.S. economy. So uh, he's been very kind to, to be here this morning. He's got a very, very tight schedule, so we're going to have a hard stop at, at 10 o'clock. Um, Ambassador Froman, please come up to the stage and welcome. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks. Thank you. We're going to do this as, a, as an informal uh, discussion, as a conversation. And again, thank you very much. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be able to have this discussion with you. Uh, let's start with the fact that you have been traveling all over the world in the last five months. And I think we would be very interested in hearing from you. What, what's your takeaway from all the meetings that you've had? Um, <coughs> You've heard a lot from people. Were, you, were there things that surprised you from what you heard? And what would you say is the, the different region's appetite for liberalization? Well, uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Peter and, and Sam, for having me. And it's great to see all of you. It's great to see Andrew Robb and Jean-Luc Demarty, two of our closest trade partners uh, and, and co-conspirators in a number of areas. And, we're very fortunate, I think you're very fortunate to have them here with you today uh, to be able to share their perspectives as well. Uh, it has been a busy, a busy four months, and I think the, uh, I make a couple observations, um, maybe going region by region, as you said. I've, I've gone to Africa twice over that period, uh, in part to launch a review of our AGOA program as uh, it comes up for renewal in a couple of years. And what's, what was very interesting about that is how central trade and investment was to the strategies of leading African leaders and reformers, but also of people. The president was in Africa, and he had a town hall meeting and he had with young people, mm -hmm. young people from all over Africa. Some were in the room in South Africa, some were on, on uh, uh, were piped in by video. The first three questions that he got in the town hall were about trade. Mm -hmm. The first two were about a Goa. Okay, there's such a sense that trade and investment is a critical part of their development strategy, and they want to see how not only preference programs, but what they can do with trade facilitation, by attracting investment, uh, so that it's not just aid, but, but also trade, it's not just assistance, but also investments that's driving their, their future. You know, with, with, with Europe, we have been working very closely uh, with the launch of, of TTIP, 
And there too, I think there's a real thirst for uh, a trade liberalizing measure that brings these two great economies closer together, bridges gaps in our regulatory and standards uh, regimes, and really helps to co contribute to a strategy of growth and competitiveness for, for both of our economies. Uh, in Asia, through TPP and otherwise, you just feel the thirst for trade liberalization everywhere you travel. Uh, negotiations going on everywhere, deals being made everywhere. There is a real desire to see that fast growing region of the world open its markets, address new issues, and we're very pleased with the progress that we're making on, on TPP in that regard. And then in Latin America, I, I, I flag a couple of things. First of all, what the Pacific Alliance is doing, mm -hmm. Mexico, Peru, Colombia, Chile, is really uh, both very innovative and very impressive in terms of taking steps to open their economies. They're obviously, most, most of those countries are partners of ours in, in, in TPP as well. But I think they're really establishing new standards for regional integration and liberalization. So I think there's a lot of exciting work going on around the world. I think the other thing, though, that surprises me on the other hand is that even with all that focus on trade liberalization, there are still countries that are pursuing, uh, increasingly so, uh, uh, localization measures, mm -hmm. setting up barriers, uh, barriers to, to digital uh, trade and, and, and commerce. Uh, we think those are self-defeating strategies in terms of, of building competitiveness, uh, and we hope that we can work with those countries to try and remove those barriers and further integrate uh, their economies with the rest of the world as well. Great. Now we have the uh, the Bali uh, summit coming, or ministerial coming up in, I guess, just about a month or so. Um, and as Sam said, uh, the ambassadors in Geneva, and I'm sure you, are working very hard to make that a success. What What is your sense of how the preparations are, are going? What um, it, Can the WTO get beyond the Doha agenda? And um, what are your expectations for Bali? Well, this is a very important ministerial uh, in our view. And, and uh, we give great credit to Roberto Acevedo for energizing the work in Geneva. They've been working really around the clock around what a package of agreements might look like uh, for, for Bali. Ambassador Punk and his team have been doing yeoman's work there really over the last several years to lay the groundwork for this. And we think that the contours of a deal are clearly evident with a binding trade facilitation agreement with the appropriate flexibilities, something on agriculture and something on development. It is a package. It has to be done together or, or, or not at all. And, and the point I would make is that uh, it is very much doable, but it's not done yet. And there's a lot of work still to do, really in all of the measures, to reach an agreement uh, by Bali. The reason why that's important is you know, in, in the WTO's almost 20-year history, it has yet to conclude a multilateral trade agreement. And you know, here is a deal that is clearly a win-win for everybody. Trade facilitation itself will reduce cost 10% for developed countries, but 14% for developing countries. This is a, a, a good development deal. It's a good multilateral deal. If we can't get this done, well, let me put it two ways. If we can get this done, this package done, then I think Bali can give further momentum to further work in Geneva taking other pieces of the Doha development round and continuing to work on them. If we can't get this win-win deal done, then I think people will look with great skepticism as to whether the WTO uh, can be a forum for meaningful trade liberalization mm -hmm. or whether it will continue to serve a very important purpose of dispute settlement and, and aid for trade and a variety of other, uh, of, other, of other mechanisms. We believe the WTO should be a strong forum for trade liberalization, and we think that this package holds the best hope for getting there. Okay, let's be optimistic and assume that, uh, that they are successful in putting together this package. Then what, in your view, should the WTO be focusing on post uh, Bali? Well, I should say, first of all, there are other things that can get done in Bali. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, the information technology agreement expansion uh, negotiations. Uh, they were suspended for a period of time uh, for reasons we all know. They're now back on track. We still have a ways to go. There, there still is a great gap among countries in terms of the staging of tariff reductions, but that's something else that could get done in Bali if the parties come to the table with enough political will. You know, I think there are a number of further things we could do. We, we obviously, TISA is an ongoing negotiation. Uh, I think there are, uh, we, the President has laid out uh, a goal of doing a, a multilateral uh, or uh, an international environmental goods and services mm -hmm. uh, agreement. That's something that could be, that could be done there. And there are other pieces of uh, the agenda, both of the Doha agenda and of new issues that could be put on the WTO agenda uh, go going going forward. You know, 
clearly, and, and Sam alluded to this in his introduction, we all believe that multilateral trade liberalization is the highest and best form of trade liberalization. Um, uh, in our view, when all countries, including emerging economies, are ready to take on responsibilities commensurate with their role in the global economy, hopefully we can get back to that. Yeah. But in the meantime, we'll pursue with the coalitions of the working, as we call them, with, uh, with whatever countries we can, progress in a plurilateral and a bilateral basis uh, to, to help liberalize trade. And we'll do that across sectors, we'll do that regionally, we'll do wherever we can to try and create momentum for further trade liberalization, all with the goal of ultimately feeding into the multilateral trading system. Well, speaking of that, you've been spending a lot of your time moving forward on the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership. And um, so what do you see as the path forward on TPP? And what can the business community be doing to help you succeed on the TPP? Well, I, I think over the last several months, uh, TPP has really kicked into high gear. We've had 19 rounds of negotiations. We've had dozens of intercessionals. We've had ministerial meetings, we've had leaders meetings. We are clearly in the end game, um, which doesn't mean that all the issues have been resolved. There are many issues still to be resolved, and as, as you know from your, from your career, it's, it's the most difficult issues that get resolved at the end of the day, and those are the issues that we're now, that we're now dealing with. Our negotiators are working virtually around the clock, uh, bilaterally, plurilaterally, around various issues here and around the world. Uh, with the goal, uh, the, the leaders have laid out the objective of completing the negotiations this year. That's an ambitious ob objective, and, uh, and we're not going to you know, agree to a, a bad agreement just for the sake of meeting a deadline, mm -hmm. but I think there is real momentum towards addressing the outstanding issues and um, demonstrating the political will necessary uh, to do so. And that was evident in the, in the leaders' meeting that we just had in, uh, in Bali. Uh, unfortunately, President Obama had to stay back here because of the, the closing down of the, of the government. But the other leaders that were there, and, and Secretary Kerry and myself, who attended on his behalf, it was a very good discussion of the challenges of finishing TPP, because it is a high standard, high discipline agreement. But also, at the end of the day, all the leaders around the table said, you know, this doesn't get any better with time. It doesn't get any easier with time. And we, we ought to focus on, on taking the, the difficult political decisions we need to be able to close out uh, this agreement, and they reaffirm the goal of completing it this year. And, and how can the business community be most helpful to you? Well, thank you for, for asking that. I think, I think there are a couple of things. I mean, here in the United States, I think the, uh, there's a lot of work to be done in, in terms of educating uh, Congress and the public about the importance of trade, the importance of TPP, the importance of the Trade Promotion Authority, which is a critical tool toward to getting any of these trade agreements, whether it's uh, TPP or TTIP. Um, uh, through Congress at the end of the day. Um, and because those debates are now happening. Right. And they're happening in Congress. And uh, there are a lot of voices out there. There's, there's good information. There's also uh, misinformation and misleading information. And the business community uh, could certainly step up and do more to educate people about what's really at stake in terms of creating jobs in the United States, creating growth in this economy, strengthening, uh, strengthening the middle class here in the United States. I think also, this is, a, this is an international conference. I think there are a lot of issues that we're dealing with in these trade agreements like, like uh, TPP, um, uh, where the business community in other countries can help educate uh, uh, governments and our counterparts about the importance of certain issues, about uh, the digital economy, about cloud computing, um, about uh, regulation of the internet. And I think that's a role that, that our business community could play um, uh, a more significant role in going forward is in making clear, not just to us, because we, you know, we, we're pursuing a lot of these issues, we've right. got these proposals on the table, but to our counterparts, what's at stake for them or their economy in terms of creating innovation economies uh, that could be globally competitive. Yeah. Now, when you were out in Bali, it wasn't just the TPP countries. I mean, there were a number of other, obviously China was there, Korea was there. Um, what was their attitude toward the TPP and was what degree of interest uh, were they showing? Well, there's a lot of interest in, in TPP. Uh, there, there are a number of other countries that have indicated either publicly or privately that once we're done, the, the 12 of us are done with this agreement, that they would potentially like to join uh, TPP going forward. And so right now it represents 40% of global GDP, but I, I fully expect that to grow from, from there. Um, but they also view TPP as one of several 
exercises going on in the Asia Pacific. You've got countries negotiating bilateral FTAs, trilateral FTAs, you have the RCEP uh, initiative underway, and, and these are not mutually exclusive. They're right. not uh, competitive uh, necessarily. I think they're all good in terms of moving trade liberalization uh, forward. So we've had a number, a number of countries, whether or not they ever wish to join TPP, they want to be kept informed, kept updated about the progress that we're making. We're very happy to, to do that and be transparent about what it is, uh, what it is we're trying to do through TPP. Uh, but I think it is one of the more exciting things going on in the Asia Pacific, and as a result, it's gotten a lot of attention. So speaking of all of these various uh, plurilaterals and so forth, uh, negotiation, regional negotiations that are going on, I mean, ideally, one would hope that there'd be a certain coherence among them in terms of level of ambition, how they approach the newer issues, whether it's the digital issues or state-owned enterprises. How does one get that coherence, and is there more that the WTO could be doing to try to foster that coherence? I, look, it's a good question. I, I, I'll, I'll tell you from our perspective. We're, we're engaged in this high standard, new discipline strategy with, with TPP. Right. Um, I think the TTIP as well will be a very high standard uh, agreement. And between TPP and TTIP, with the current members, that's about 65% of the global economy. When you add the members who have expressed interest in joining, you know, you're going to be somewhere north of that. And I think as there is a critical mass of the global economy that's willing to live by certain standards, it makes it easier over time for those standards to, to enter the bloodstream of the multilateral trading system and to be accepted more broadly. Not every company, not every country is ready to accept those standards right now, but our hope is as more and more countries get comfortable and, and deal with the, the, the challenging issues, domestically or otherwise, that are required to, to, to embrace those standards, that it'll make it easier for the multilateral tr system to adopt them uh, as well over time. In terms of what the WTO could do, I think there's a, a lot of, uh, there's a big role for the WTO in, in ensuring transparency mm -hmm. of, of various uh, regional trade agreements and bilateral trade agreements and plays a critical role, uh, uh, plays a critical role there. Um, and I think, you know, there's a, there's sort of a top-down and a bottom-up approach. Uh, looking at, at trade facilitation, uh, looking at ITA, looking at TISA, if those things can be done through the WTO at the same time that these regional trade agreements are growing up, you're beginning to, to close the gap, and you're beginning mm -hmm. to cover more and more of global trade. Right. Uh, TISA, as you know, currently covers about 90% of, uh, excuse me, 70% right. of, of the global services trade. ITA, ITA expansion covers 90% of global trade in that sector. So these are you know, very significant pillars of what could be uh, a much broader uh, multilateral uh, trading system. Yeah. You mentioned, of course, uh, Trade Promotion Authority, and there's been a lot of work done, uh, certainly at the staff level up on the Hill, and I'm sure with the administration. Um, what do you see as the prospects there, and um, is, can this be can this be a bi uh, bipartisan outcome? I, I think it certainly can and, and, and should be. Uh, as you said, there's been a lot of work done uh, by uh, the Ways and Means Committee and, and the Finance Committee. We are uh, working uh, with them. The President has made clear that he'd like to get Trade Promotion Authority. He's said that publicly. He's talked to the congressional leadership uh, about that. Uh, and we've, uh, I've testified, others have testified about that as well. And we're engaged. We're up there every week. I'm up there spending a good part of each week up there meeting with members individually or in groups uh, to make sure they understand what Trade Promotion Authority is and it isn't. It is Congress's exercise of its constitutional authority. It's the mechanism by which Congress gives us our marching orders about what to negotiate, how to work with Congress during the negotiations, and the conditions under which uh, they will consider an agreement when it's, when it's done. And we are working you know, very closely with, with Chairman Baucus and, and Chairman Camp. We're also working with uh, Congressman Levin. Uh, with, uh, we've had consultations with Senator Brown and, and Senator Hatch, and we want this we want to get TPA as soon as possible, and we want it to be able to attract as broad support, bipartisan support, uh, as possible. And we're, we're very much engaged in that process. Right. Um, now, for the last five years, you've been sitting at the big table in the, in the White House, uh, looking at the big macro issues as well as trade. So what do you see as the, the greatest challenges to American competitiveness over the next five years? Um, and where does trade fit into that? Well, you know, I think, I think a nation's competitiveness fundamentally turns on how it deals with its challenges and its opportunities. 
And um, you know, as, a, as a, I think if we look back over the last several years, we took dramatic action at the end of the, uh, during the financial crisis to get our economy going again, to fixing our banking system. Uh, and now our banks are healthy, our corporates are healthy, the housing market is recovering, consumer sentiment uh, is improved. We've had uh, job creation, um, uh, more than seven million new jobs, not as fast and as many as we would like, but there's mm -hmm. been good job creation now for, for almost four years. Um, and so I think we're on the right track. We've also had an energy revolution here in the United States with uh, newfound sources of cleaner energy that are really leading to a renaissance in investment in manufacturing mm -hmm. in the United States. So I think it positions the United States very well to be a place where companies want to locate, where they want to manufacture. And when you think about being in the, in, in the, the nexus of TPP and, and TTIP and, and our other uh, trade initiatives, being able to uh, use the U.S. as a platform for exporting to, uh, through free trade to 65 plus percent of the world, it gives a real opportunity here for American competitiveness. We also got to de have to deal with our challenges. We are dealing with health care, which is obviously an issue of, of, of great debate uh, and importance mm -hmm. right now. Uh, we've been dealing with education. We have um, uh, great deficits in infrastructure that we need to deal with. And obviously, from a political perspective, we need to be able to deal with our fiscal situation in a responsible uh, manner. And those are all things that we're, we're looking to do. How trade fits in, I think, is really the, on the opportunity side. That uh, through TPP, through TTIP, uh, through these negotiations in Geneva, through AGOA, uh, we have the real, through some of our outreach to, uh, to the Middle East, um, we have a real opportunity to use trade to open markets, to further integrate the global economy, and to position the U.S. from a competitiveness point of view as being able to take advantage of the fact that 95% of, of the world's consumers are, are outside the United States. Mm -hmm. And you know, we need to be deeply engaged in those markets you know, as other countries are, are you know, engaging in negotiations and, and um, um, trying to get access to those markets as well. Yeah. Um, a while ago I read an article and it was about the, uh, a survey that the Council on Foreign Relations does periodically. And um, I don't know, I think it was something like 10 years ago, uh, they asked Americans, do trade agreements help the U.S. economy or hurt the U.S. economy? And then something like 50% of the people said trade agreements help the U.S. economy. And then when they did the survey more recently, it was something like only 25% of people thought that trade agreements helped the U.S. economy, and 50% felt that trade agreements hurt the U.S. economy. Mm. So what are we doing wrong, and particularly the business community, in terms of getting the word out effectively that uh, trade agreements, properly done, are a plus for the U.S. economy. Well, um, I haven't seen that particular survey, but I've seen, I've seen, uh, I've seen some surveys. I've seen some surveys that point in the other direction that really? it's been an improving picture. But I think your your point is still a very important one, and I'd underscore the words you used, doing them right, mm -hmm. because much of the debate I see around trade, uh, including what we're hearing right now about TPA or TPP. Um, is as if the world was in 1993, not as if the world was in 2013. Mm -hmm. you know, the, President Obama came into, into office with the view that um, uh, global engagement was absolutely important to our future, uh, our ability to, to engage and export our way, but that we had to do trade differently than had been done in the past. We had to make sure that the benefits were broadly shared and that we were using trade agreements not just to open markets, but also to level the playing field for American workers and, and farmers and ranchers and entrepreneurs and investors and consumers. And so what we've been doing over the last five years has been, and that's why, for example, you know, he directed us to take the Korea, Colombia, and uh, Panama free trade agreements and improve upon them before submitting them to Congress. Uh, it's why TPP is centered around high standards and new discipline. Um, why TTIP as well is very much focused on what we can do with a, another advanced industrialized market to, to, bridge, our, to bridge our differences and to, to increase our competitiveness. It's all about making sure that as we open markets, you know, we take on issues like state-owned enterprises right. and the role that they play in the global economy to ensure that they don't put private firms, whether in those countries or in our country, at a competitive uh, disadvantage. 
Um, it's also why we, 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 we uh, pay such attention to, to labor issues and environmental issues, to intellectual property rights, um, why we insist in TPA that it be, a, that it be combined with trade adjustment assistance. Mm -hmm. That's a, a key part of our bargain with the American people, that if we're going to open markets, we're also going to um, ad address uh, dislocations that might occur. And so uh, that's our trade policy. It, sometimes people are arguing over a trade policy that doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, President Obama came in and said, we're going to do trade policy better, we're going to do it differently, and that's precisely why we're, we're doing these agreements the way that we're doing them. Mm -hmm. And in terms of what the, the, American, the business community right. can do, I think, again, making real the impact of trade on their companies, on their employees, on their communities. Uh, as we, we, we all know the anecdotal stories of uh, we, open a, we open an economy through a trade agreement and a company puts on another shift and they start shipping more products and they're hiring more people. We need to be able to tell those stories over and over again and so that people understand you know, that it's not just big companies that are benefiting, but it's the whole supply chain of small and medium-sized enterprises. It's manufacturing as well as services and, and agriculture uh, because that's a, a key part of building support. Uh, in this in this country for our ability to continue with trade. And the last thing I would say, Peter, is it, part of the bargain is around enforcement. Mm -hmm. and, and this administration has been very committed to using all of the tools at its disposal to enforce its trade rights and its trade laws. And we've, we've doubled the, the pace of enforcement uh, um, uh, of previous administrations. We've set up a special unit, uh, the Interagency uh, Trade uh, Enforcement Center, to be able to bring capabilities to enforcement that we haven't had before. And that's part of the, of the, of the deal, that if, again, if we're going to open markets uh, to, to, uh, to, our, uh, to our trading partners, we're also going to make sure that our firms and our workers can compete on a fair and level playing field. Right. Turning to a somewhat different subject, there's so much criticism of Washington and as being dysfunctional and, and so forth. Are you worried that with all of this criticism that the best and the brightest no longer will want public ser to be public servants? Well, look, it's a very good question, and, and you know from your history, I'm, I'm privileged to, to be at, at, at USTR, and I've had the privilege of working at the White House and, and Treasury and other agencies around uh, the department. And USTR staff is among the very best, the most dedicated, the hardest working, the most professional of any civil group of civil servants anywhere uh, in the government. And they are working under extraordinarily uh, difficult circumstances, budgetary circumstances, trying to do their jobs without being able to fill vacancies or get on a plane and you know, see the, the the counterparty as often as uh, as they would like, and they're doing it and they're doing it at a time when we have the most robust trade agenda, you know, perhaps for the last uh, thirty or forty years. And so, uh, I have huge respect for my my colleagues at USTR and for all that they're doing. I think more generally, you know, there's a my uh, uh, former colleague, Mark Grossman, at the oh State yeah. Department, former ambassador, you know, when he came back into government, he said, you know, there is no greater privilege than coming to work every day in a building that's flying the American flag. And I think there's a, a, that's a widespread feeling out there among young people uh, in the United States that you know, I've had the privilege of working in the, in the private sector as well as the public sector. I've had great opportunities and, and experiences in both. But there is something special about being able to give back to your country, about being able to contribute to resolving some of these very uh, challenging and difficult issues. Um, and I think that will always, at the end of the day, attract the best and the brightest because there's just something incredibly self-fulfilling about being able to, uh, to, to do public service. No, I agree with you. And, and I must say that when I was in Geneva, and uh, every time the chairman at the, at the uh, WTO said, United States, you have the floor. I mean, it really does. It feels. You, it hits yeah, you inside. Little, yeah, it sounds corny, but you, you know, there's a little you know heart palpitation there. So yeah, you know. no, that that's true. We do face a lot of new challenges, uh, and you will be facing them in the negotiations, um, especially with respect to the digital revolution, and that is opening so many incredible opportunities, and particularly for the services. Uh, industries. Um, what, what are the biggest challenges there? Obviously, we have the specific challenge of recent revelations, but uh, getting that across to people as to what the possibilities are, 
I mean, that is going to be, I guess, one of your challenges in, the, in all of these negotiations. I think that is one of our challenges, and, and I'd also, to go back to an earlier question, I think that's one of the challenges for the, the business community, yeah. uh, to be able to explain um, uh, to people around the world uh, what's in their interest about being networked with the rest of the world, of having data flowing between uh, but between countries, what it allows them to do that they can't otherwise do. You know, we were talking with a company the other day who came in, who in, in one of our TPP countries has, a, uh, has 1,400 employees managing their data from all over the world. Mm -hmm. If people start erecting barriers to data flows, there's no reason for them to hire those 1,400 people. Right. They'd fire them tomorrow and have to manage their data some other way. I don't think uh, necessarily uh, countries realize how integrated their economies are because of the, the expansion of broadband, because of the internet, uh, because of the business models of, 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 uh, of global companies and their companies, that there are flows of data and there are interconnections that greatly benefit them, their ability to innovate, their ability to attract investment, their ability to, to create jobs, and we need to make that case and, and make it more clear What's really, what's really at stake there. Obviously, there are very serious and legitimate uh, privacy issues, and those have to be dealt with as well. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but I'm, I'm confident, uh, whether it's in TPP or, or TTIP, that we'll be able to work through uh, those difficult issues and, uh, and come up with something that, that, at the end of the day, this is all about creating jobs, increasing competitiveness, and, and I'm, I'm confident we'll be able to strike the right um, uh, uh, disciplines and balance here to do that. Great. Um, you've been very kind in terms of um, allowing us to have a s part of this for questions um, from the audience. So if we can move to that sure. segment. Uh, there are microphones that will be circulating. So if you could raise your hand, and then when you do speak, please identify yourself and your affiliation. It's hard for us to see you, so uh, we'll count on. All right, there's a question over here. Hi, Len Brack and Bloomberg BNA. Could you discuss some of the um, provisions pr um, concerning uh, financial services with regard to the TPP agreement, and perhaps compare that with the um, with the TTIP? Well, um, as much as it would be attractive to negotiate in public here with you, Len, <laughs> I think uh, I, I think I'll probably uh, leave that to the, the leave that to the negotiating rounds. Uh, let, me, let me simply say, you know, financial services are a critical part of, uh, of both negotiations. Uh, it's a critical, critical part of our economy. It's an area of, uh, of great competitiveness, and it helps uh, um, uh, spur economic activity throughout our trading partners' economies. And so uh, we certainly are, uh, it's high on our agenda to, to address those issues, but I, I think I'd probably best leave the specifics of the provisions to our negotiations themselves. There's a question here. Uh, I'm Mike Morrow, and I'm with Capital Capital. And uh, I just feel at this point in the TPP uh, Behind you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do you feel at this point in the TPP negotiation that you pretty ha much have Congress on board uh, with, with where the direction of this is going? And I know there was, was a recent announcement this, this week of a group of friends of the TPP, but I know there's also been uh, some voices of opposition raised. Do you, how, how do you feel the... Uh, the state of play is with Congress right now in terms of if you do get an agreement in the next couple of months, uh, we got to be able to get through Congress okay. Well, first of all, throughout the negotiation, we have been consulting very closely uh, with Congress uh, throughout. While the, the consultation procedures of the 2002 grant of trade promotion authority have lapsed, we have up, uh, upheld those consultation procedures nonetheless. And so every proposal that we put on the table in any negotiation is previewed with our committees of jurisdiction and other relevant committees, depending on the subject matter. Uh, and we keep them, we, we have literally hundreds of meetings on the Hill around various issues. As members, uh, any member of Congress can see the text, and uh, we have gone up uh, dozens or scores of times to uh, meet with members, bring them the text that they, that they want to see, and walk them through it, answer any questions they have. And so uh, it's very important. I mean, the, the role, the, the relationship with Congress and the role that Congress plays in trade policy is absolutely critical. And it's one reason we, we invest uh, uh, so much effort in ensuring that we're working with them hand in glove. At the end of the day, of course, the agreement's not done yet. And so it's hard to be for or against 
um, uh, anything until you could actually you know, see the, the totality of the agreement because as, as people in this room who've done this much longer than I have know, you know nothing is agreed to till, till everything's agreed to. And so once the agreement's done and we can walk through all of the provisions and people can see the balance of interests and how we've resolved various issues, you know, I'm, I'm confident there will be support there. But w it'll be, we'll have to do a lot of, of work and to make sure people understand uh, exactly what we have and have, have not done through this negotiation and we're fully committed to doing that. There's a question way in the back. Hi, uh, I'm Matt Schuel from Inside US Trade, hoping, Mr. Froman, we can make this a daily routine. Yeah, you here. asked me a question yesterday. I mean, <laughs> where are you going to be tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> See you at the, at the uh, investment summit on Friday. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, well, I wanted to ask a question about. Uh, are you stalking me? <laughs> <laughs> it's my <Probably>. job. <laughs> uh, about TPP and specifically on the issue of state of an enterprise, because I know this has been an issue that's been at the forefront for the Services Coalition and the U.S. business community. Um, so I was just wondering if you could give us kind of an update of of where that effort is in TPP, um, because there's been strong uh, political pushback, uh, most publicly from Malaysia. You know, I think when you met with the Malaysian minister uh, with the whole group in Brunei, uh, you know, he was put out a press release saying uh, about how this was one of the issues that he was really gonna push back on. And I imagine there's probably other countries uh, too who are uh, pushing back. So I was just wondering if you could kind of give us an update of, of where those talks are and, and what is the US doing to, to advance them in the face of, of opposition? Well, that's a good example. Uh, State-owned enterprise is an area of, of new disciplines that we're trying to define as a group uh, through, through TPP. And it is one of the, the, the more challenging issues and one of the issues uh, that, uh, that, that will you know, be very much dealt with as we, as we reach the end of the negotiations. Um, I think everybody understands and everybody shares the view that there should be a level playing field between state-owned enterprises and private enterprises when they're engaging in commercial activity. And I think the question is how to define that discipline uh, in, the, in the way that, uh, that, that makes the most sense. You know, after Bali, I, I went to Kuala Lumpur and spent a, a day there meeting with various uh, uh, ministers and, and parliamentarians. I had very good discussions with them about state-owned enterprises and government procurement and, and, and other issues because these are issues of sensitivity to Malaysia but also other countries. And I think we're, we're all working well together to figure out how to define the highest standards possible in these areas while taking into account the particular sensibilities and, and sensitivities of particular countries. And that's the exercise that we're going through now. So it's been a, a very rich discussion. I think every TPP country has brought um, uh, their experience and their perspective in a very constructive way to the table and that we expect over the, the course of the, the remaining uh, negotiations to together define something that, that makes sense and that, that raises the bar and that adds to the global trading system new disciplines that reflect the increasing role the state-owned enterprises are playing in the global economy. And that's ultimately our objective. Okay. Are there any questions on this side? I don't want to shortchange people. I see your hand there. Okay. Thank you. David Lewis with Manchester Trade here in Washington. Um, AGOA and the Caribbean Basin Initiative have been very successful in growth of exports to the U.S., but the focus has been mostly goods. Is the administration discussing anything as to upgrading them, modernizing them into services, which is really the fastest growing sector, and most of these economies are, unbeknownst to many, already services and not goods economies? It's a, very, it's a very good question. We have, as I mentioned, launched uh, a review of AGOA. Uh, we launched it in August and, and are working with our uh, African partners, with uh, constituencies, businesses, diaspora groups, uh, and others to figure out uh, what, if any, changes we want to make to AGOA as we go to Congress to seek its renewal before it expires in 2015. And part of what we're doing is asking our African partners, what, what are your economic objectives going forward? Africa's changed a lot. Parts of Africa have changed a lot in the last 12 years, 13 years. What are their economic objectives and how can a GOA help uh, promote them? Uh, to be fair, most of the discussion has really been around goods, but we are uh, uh, we're engaging in a broad-based discussion 
and we'll look forward to engaging with them on, on the whole range of issues that, that may be of importance to them. Okay, anything else? Gentleman back here. Hello, uh, my name is Matt Keller. I'm with the Embassy of Liechtenstein here in Washington. Um, with the recent revelations of the uh, NSA spying, uh, especially on European leaders, uh, there's of course talk and also movement here in Congress on uh, reforming uh, intelligence gathering in the United States, uh, also as well as talking with European leaders in terms of uh, intelligence gathering and sharing of information. There's now also talk in terms of consumer data um, that's being uh, collected in the commercial realm and perhaps this being something that would also be a part of a greater uh, negotiation with Europe in terms of just reforming data collection in general in the commercial realm as well as in the intelligence area. Uh, and I'd learn, therefore like to know your view on uh, how this could, if, if, if this is something you could see in terms of not being part of the TTIP negotiations but a separate uh, type of uh, talk regarding that. Well, first I'm uh, obviously not gonna comment on Intelligence matters, I'm gonna leave that to our intelligence colleagues and their counterparts um, in other countries. Uh, you know, I would say that th this are obviously uh, issues around privacy um, that are uh, legitimate and significant and that we're gonna have to deal with uh, uh, whether it's in TTIP or, uh, or otherwise. Um, I think the TTIP negotiations uh, we view as separate from these other issues. We think that they stand on their own two feet. That there's a logic to them that goes to job creation, competitiveness of our two economies, and we're looking forward to working with our European counterparts to, to, work, through, to work through these issues. Uh, my sense is that some of these issues will, will arise in that context, and because we will have discussions of the digital economy as we're having in TPP, and we'll need to deal with them accordingly. Great. Well, thank you very much, Ambassador. Do you have any parting words that you want to send out to the audience? Like I'd, all I'd say is, uh, the work that you all do as services industries is absolutely critical. We know how important it is um, from the U.S. perspective that we have, uh, you know, a surplus in our services exports. That it's a, uh, it's a, an increasing part of our manufacturing process, our services. Uh, that when you look at global value chains, services are playing a more and more important uh, role. Um, uh, we are trying to make sure that our trade policy reflects those interests and that we're able to. Uh, learn from the industry and from other stakeholders the best way to uh, to ensure that we're pursuing the strongest possible innovation and competitiveness policy, including in the services sector. So we very much appreciate all that you're doing and, and uh, look forward to working with you. Well, thank you very much. And I think I can speak for the entire audience in uh, thanking you and pledging to you that as you go forward with your negotiations, whatever help you need from this community, please feel free to ask. Thank you very, very Thanks much. Thanks very much. Okay. Okay. Thanks.